I'm in the midst of doing a Vipassana self course at my house just for three days. That's the original intention anyway. It's day two right now and I'm doing five hours a day and obviously doing some work and stuff as I'm doing it, um, i.e. this podcast. But um, I got a request to follow up the previous episode I made where I talked about it was like the first five of the 18 Vipassana courses I've done. And uh, I don't know, it just felt like especially um, hopefully helpful to do it while I'm in the midst of more intensely meditating outside of a course than I've ever done before. I've never sat five hours a day in my regular life before now. And it's pretty trippy to see how, I mean, I've said so many times in this podcast so far, I mean, I've talked about how difficult it's been for me to do these recordings. And I was experiencing the same thing coming into this. And I had a pretty difficult time meditating today. And I was noticing that a lot of sensations were coming up in my upper back. Um, and then like after I think like the first three ish hours of meditation today, the sensations that have been like in my right and mid back, right and mid upper back, those cleared. And then it was sensations that were remaining in my like upper left back, like behind my shoulder, the back of my shoulder. And I understood in a way that I hadn't before that, uh, this like binge eating compulsion that I've had since I was a little kid, like as long as I can remember, it seems to be very connected to these whatever trauma is still locked up in my shoulders, which seems like it was releasing today. Um, And as it cleared more, once I meditated, as the day continued, um, I started to, I had like just a bunch more energy and I felt like I could do this recording now. I'm doing this at like 11, after 11 o'clock at night, because I just want to. And this block that I felt previously that was getting in the way of speaking and making it seem like a chore to, to like a chore to bring myself to do this. I like, I enjoy it once I start doing it. Um, but that really started clearing and I just felt like I, like I was thinking about like how I I just have all this energy now. Like I can be so much more quote unquote productive, but like not in a weird strivey, like capitalism-y bad masculine energy way that society has conditioned us to be but like because I feel like it because I it feels good to try and do things that I want to do and that just feels accessible when I'm in this place and a few days ago I think it was the night before I started doing this little mini course um I was going to sleep well I was like in bed and I was reading I'm reading this book Mangela on Mangela it's like a bunch of collections of interviews with the director Anthony, Anthony Mangella, uh, mostly conducted by Sidney Pollack, who was also a director and they were like creative partners and stuff for anyone who doesn't know. And, uh, and so much of it, I don't know, it was just pieces of it are really beautiful, I think. And he had a lot of really healthy feminine energy and brought that into his approach to filmmaking. And, uh, I just felt this sense of like, being on the cusp of being really, really happy (laughs) and also feeling this sense of power connected to that that hasn't been available to me before. Um, And like in this healthy way, like I could step into it and just like be more fully self-expressed without sort of like worry of attack, fear of attack, which is the only way that some pseudo form of power has felt accessible to me in the past. And I'm so certain that that's very much what this this like trauma I'm holding in my body and my shoulder like in my back my upper back is about it's like this fear of attack I even remember thinking that I think I was like 13 or something and I remember my mom like criticizing me for uh like holding she was like why do you hold your shoulders up all the time in this tone of voice that meant that it was like an unattractive thing for a girl a teenage girl to do and I still do it now like whatever, 24 years later. And, uh, and I have like broad shoulders or whatever anyway, but like I do this thing where I like just hold them up a little bit all the time. And it's, it's such a function of just feeling like bracing myself, you know? And, uh, so it's going to be interesting to see that now that I feel like the Sankara of that, the trauma that I've held in my body, like Sankara is the word you learn at the Vipassana courses for essentially like unhealed 
yeah, unhealed trauma that we're holding in our mind body, in the mind body phenomenon that we're releasing through Vipassana as that's clearing. Um, and I think you often, it's, it's certainly not necessary to intellectually understand this, the ties between what you're clearing and where it's showing up physically in your body and whatever. Um, but I'm finding as I become more aware that I, I'm more and more capable of seeing those specific connections. And I feel convinced that this like attacky thing is like, I'm holding it in my shoulders and it just kind of makes sense. But yeah, as it's clearing, it'll be interesting to see if I'm better able to just do things and not like if I lose that fear of attack, um, I'll be able to perform and not care. I'll be able to be like way more fun in a, like a genuine way. Like not, I mean, I feel like I used to be really fun, <laughs> really fun, quote unquote. Uh, but I, I, I had a lot of fun at least. And, uh, and then like alcohol was like a huge part of that for a long time. And there'd be like the five drink period that was really fun. And then six drinks on, I'd just be like a nightmare and like people didn't want me around. And I'd be off-putting and do things I didn't remember that were probably awful. And yeah, it's just like I thought for a while that like once I can get to the point where um, I'm able to be as uninhibited sober as I used to, like as I used to use alcohol to get to in the past, that that'll be an enormous, like personal, an enormous sign of personal progress. And this fear of a tacky thing, I didn't get this before starting this little like mini Vipassana course I'm doing for myself. Um, but now I really get in a, it's so funny too, cause it just seems so obvious now and it's just like crystal clear, but I just didn't see it in this way before. But, um, this fear of attack thing is so connected to that. And I'm aware of how it even shows up in like stuff with seeds, like worrying that if something doesn't look professional enough, quote unquote, whatever the hell that means. And, um, which is some of my own internalized, like, um, internalized beliefs about capitalistic things I think and like stuff you learn you know if you go to like a quote-unquote good school whatever like that thing um and some of it's probably millennially too like uh, I don't know I mean I feel like when I know like Gen Z kids I know who like went to fancy colleges have a similar sort of thing which is um this certain specific conditioning so I guess maybe it's less generational than I was thinking um, if you went to institutions like that and stuff. But uh, I just feel like, I don't know, there's a certain, like I need to be on top of things in this specific way. And when I'm not, and things are messier lately, like stuff at Seeds needs to be cleaned up and like we need help in these other ways and I'm looking for it and constantly have this internal debate regarding like whether I need to be learning how to build things to improve our ecosystem myself or if it needs to be about finding somebody else to do that because I've had so many bad experiences in the past with people who were supposed to like help with building things who didn't do either did bad jobs or just were bad actors um because I I had the Sankara of like continually choosing people I couldn't truly trust because that was all I knew so I think that's clearing out as well with this shoulder thing hopefully um yeah so I'm just excited to see what can come up on the other side of it and it's interesting to, do, to be doing this mini course and also kind of doing some work at the same time and therefore being becoming more aware of um how this is showing up in my life in a way that I couldn't see before and you don't get that at a course you know like you just because you're like totally separate um, which is wonderful and it allows you to go deeper in a lot of ways, but I don't know, just, this has been kind of an interesting little experiment to do to kind of see, um, yeah, what I'm able to do just by myself in my house <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, and kind of see this coming up in real time and to be able to kind of process it like verbally, I guess. Um, and I can, I've been writing a little bit. Um, yeah, so it's just, it's been kind of interesting, but Whatever. Anyway, I was asked to continue talking about the my experience with the 18 Vipassana courses I've done so far. And um, if you're interested in that and you didn't see it, there's like a part one a few episodes ago. Um, I got through the first five courses I'd done in that recording. So I'm going to start talking about the sixth course I've done, the sixth Vipassana course I've done, which was in December of 2017. 
so leading up to that things just kind of like fucking like fell apart like I was the brokest I've ever been in my life which was saying a lot um that's where it got to the point where like I couldn't buy food um and was stealing food from grocery stores I was I didn't now that I've like engaged more with people who are unhoused I, I have a better understanding of like terminology so um I was unhoused I didn't have secure housing I never slept on the street but I didn't have secure housing for for a long period of time um I mean what's a long period of time I mean it was like certainly months at a stretch and I, I haven't had a car since I was like 21 years old so I wasn't sleeping in a car um but yeah I didn't know where I was gonna go for a while and was bouncing around and stuff but yeah, by the time the end of 2017 happened, um, if I have any astrology heads listening, I'd love to know the specifics because I don't, off the top of my head, I don't remember, um, I think like Saturn went into Capricorn right around that time and uh, I'm super Aries-y, I'm Aries, sun, moon and rising and so Capricorn's my 10th house and uh, I think right around there, that coming in, it just, it just made so many things that weren't working about seeds Um, and relating to money just come apart and it was a huge blessing long term but it was just so difficult as it was happening and so I had I'd made an ether trade that year I started buying ether in like February of 2017 at around I think $17 a coin so that trade was it had gone up a ton heading into the end of the year um but just like I had to do with bitcoin in 20 late 2013 early 2014 I ended up having to sell my position to cover bills for seeds seeds wasn't profitable yet and uh and it ended up you know like it ended up being a good trade because the 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 price came down so much in uh like january of the following year and i had a sense of that because my experience as a trader or whatever but it still like was a bummer and it wouldn't have been something i would have had to do if there were more um you know like support from investors and just like generally less misogyny in um crypto investment startup investment in general and like in the world (laughs) broadly yeah so it was just like this perfect storm and things just fell apart and like I remember it was interesting like there I've mentioned him previously in other podcast episodes this guy Abish Bama um I guess he's a former friend because once I called him out for like mansplaining one time he like explained to me why he wasn't mansplaining and I haven't heard from him since but for a period of time, he would show up as though he were almost like channeling messages that I was meant to hear. Um, and I don't certainly don't mean to like make it sound as though that was like his sole function or something. It was just like he, he brought these messages into me in a way that no other person I've engaged with who wasn't like a spiritual practitioner or somebody I was like going to to talk about shit like that. He really did. And the first time was in um, it was like late I guess it was late 2013. I think it was around Christmas where I, I was still on Facebook then and I would like make these gratitude posts. I'd post like three things I was grateful for that day or something. And at one point I included Bitcoin on like a little, on a list of three things I was grateful for. And he saw it and we reconnected then. I'd helped him out years before and helping him get a job at a trading firm I worked at in Chicago. Um, and, uh, he was already, he'd already like founded a crypto startup by that time. And he ended up staying with me. Like I invited him to stay, crash in my place when he came to New York. I was living in New York then and uh, in Bushwick specifically. And he told me about uh, a Bitcoin focused startup accelerator he had gone through. And so I ended up applying to that on behalf of Seeds and Seeds got in and that was helpful and whatever. Um, and he told me other things too about like how he like fundraising techniques he'd use on this site called angel list that I used back then too, and was able to raise some money off of that. And yeah, so he like brought this message in. So anyway, fast forward to 2017 and I'm like hitting rock bottom money wise. Like it had been hard a bunch of times before this, but like chunks of money would come in periodically, but now it was just like, like I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was walking around, I was in San Francisco reluctantly I like just ended up being there a lot and then eventually kind of I guess living there I mean I didn't have a place anywhere else um but I was just there a lot because like tech kind of sucked me into that place um and it's it's such a beautiful city and it used to be such a cool weird city but it's just been destroyed by fucking tech and capitalism and it's like a tragedy and I think there's been kind of an exodus since then and I think like 
I mean, some people have come from that area down south, like down to the LA area where I am now. And I wonder if that's going to continue. But yeah, so I'm like walking around San Francisco. I'm going to like the co-working space that we had then. We were late on the payments. Um, And uh, I was carrying a duffel bag with all of my shit in it. And I run into Avish on the street. Like pure coincidence, whatever, serendipity. And he, we're talking, catching up a little. And I think I said something about how broke I was and how I didn't know what I was going to do. And he's like, have you thought about doing an ICO, an initial coin offering? So what he was saying was like, have you thought about creating a cryptocurrency, basically? So Seeds had existed. Seeds was incorporated in February of 2013. But at first we fo- focused on micro lending. And I kind of talked about this in an earlier podcast episode. But And I was interested in crypto and saw crypto fitting into how seeds would work as early as like 2013. But initially I figured like, oh, we could send money to people in the developing world, like in Bitcoin or something like that. That's what seemed to make sense. But then when Ethereum was introduced uh, and went live in 2015, uh, right? 2015, July, 2015, right? Um, Then it was like, oh, it's going to be possible to, and relatively easily easy to build your own cryptocurrency on top of this crypto network. So it suddenly became a much more accessible thing to think about creating our own crypto and figuring out how that could fit in with the ecosystem and how it could make sense. Um, yeah, so just like running into Avish, it was like, oh, okay, like like I, I had this conscious sense even at that time that the universe was telling me to pay attention to this and start thinking strongly about that idea, like strongly considering that idea and figuring out how to do it. Um, so we did that. So Seeds, the cryptocurrency was created like, October of 2017 and so okay so then I'm going to this then the the bottom really fell out a little bit after that um I don't even remember like the specific timeline but by December I had hit that place where I was so broke that like I said I couldn't buy food and would like rob the whole foods down the street and like fucking eat the food in the whole foods sitting area like telling myself that this isn't like Jeff Bezos can afford it and whatever it's not hurting him um, and then at the co-working space where we were behind, we were behind on the payments, like it had a couch upstairs in this kind of like loft area. And so I would like sneak in there at night and sleep on the couch upstairs and people didn't know I was doing it. And it was a Saturday, I remember, and I was on the couch, like I woke up that morning and I was meditating. And this was after, uh, Ushma Garg, who is the founder of Gobble. Um, so like, I don't recommend Gobble. If you're, if you're looking for a food delivery service, she had told me she'd send me $200 for groceries and didn't do that. So I'm sitting on this couch and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm meditating. I start doing Vipassana. And I like, no, like I shit you not. I had this idea come in that I could, um, I should look at PayPal right then. So I stopped meditating and looked at PayPal, realized that Seeds had like a $3,500 credit line available that I was not aware we had. And so I was able to make a payment that I needed to make and uh, like a business payment. And I was able to get it. Uh, I found, I realized that Southwest like lets you pay for plane tickets with PayPal. So I was able to get a plane ticket to my parents' house where I could at least like be inside a house and like they were nice enough to feed me and stuff. So I did that. I like had to go home and I was 33 years old. <laughs> I was like, that's like old to go home, to have to go home. Although I guess that's less, that's. Uh, it's a more frequent occurrence anymore with like everything that's fucked up about this economic system and the way it's kind of like collapsing. So I'm there. But in December of 2017, I wanted to do a course and had a little more money and was able to pay for a plane ticket to go sit a course in Southern California. So I'm coming into it, you know, off of this severest brokenness situation um, I got a ride to the center as I typically do. And it's usually really fun to do that. They have like a, a ride share like board or something that you can use. And those rides are always super fun in my experience, almost always. Um, but yeah. And so this nice guy, John, gave me a ride. And I remember like we stopped at like a coffee shop or something. Um, no, it was like a gas station and he was getting snacks or coffee or something. And I remember just looking around and thinking about how like I didn't have enough money to buy like anything at all in the gas station. <laughs> and uh, and then we picked up another girl from Pasadena who went by the name L, like E-L. Um, L, if you ever hear this, I'm so sorry that I don't remember. I, I think 
Elle like emigrated from Korea and we had this sense that we'd known each other before, which has happened so many times to me at Vipassana courses and it's happened kind of more frequently as I've gone along. Um, I had this sense of just kind of like wanting to take care of her and she had this really gentle femme energy that was like very sweet and it was her first course and like she her a ride she was supposed to get a ride with somebody else but it fell through and so like John was just able to go pick her up and so we rode together to the the center it's in like Joshua Tree um so it's like what three hours outside of LA something like that and uh and John told like stories about how I mean his dad had died not too long before as I recall and he, he was talking about how he, like, right after his dad died, he, like, looked down at his body and he just knew he was going to, like, spiral out on meth. And so he did that. I think it was meth. It could have been crack. I think it was meth, though. And uh, had had this long journey, like, navigating addiction stuff and had healed a lot of it and had started doing meditation and had found, like, teachers. He talked about one teacher he'd come across who really emphasized that they thought that, like, meta – which is loving kindness meditation was the key to everything. And at Vipassana courses, you learn meta um, as sort of like a, like I think he uses the word, the teacher uses the word like salve to put on the wound after you're clearing things out through Vipassana, you put the meta on top of that. So it is part of, it's something that's taught at the courses, but um, they emphasize that it's like, it's the Vipassana that clears out your shit that actually removes the stuff that's blocking you from, reaching liberation so yeah and john was a little like like know it all um and i was thinking about how i was like like attracting know it all male people around that time um and i remember i didn't like being in the desert that was the first time i'd been at that center and the desert felt methy to me <laughs> um i think i might have some past life stuff about deserts though actually like like not fun past lives that were spent in desert places but yeah, so there, we went to the course and it started and um, I remember on like, I think day two or so, I got my period and I was having like intensely terrible cramps. I don't normally have cramps, like menstrual cramps that are that bad, but it was like in my lower left gut, um, which I think is where a specific past life death injury had been. And so it, it made me, it gave me the sense that like the cramps were sort of helping me like, because they were so intense, it gave me this other opportunity within the context of a course to practice being equanimous, even as this stronger physical pain was coming up. Um, and I think it was helping me to be equanimous, you know, like specifically about this area of my body where there's a sankara that wants to heal. The, the death injury from that specific sankara, I think, and this is something that's come up a bunch in like past life regression sessions I've done. Um, I think I've talked a little bit about this before, but it was like a native life. I think it, a native American life, um, which is, it's weird. Like Amerigo Vespucci was like the fifth white guy that came here or something. And then like, but then also like Italians weren't considered white back then. And like all of that, the concept of like quote unquote native American is weird, but it, it was native. And I think it was like uh, in what's now the United States. And uh I was male and I had this like really strong, calm energy and I was like a chief or something. And uh, a white person with like a bayonet, a male person, um, killed me by stabbing me in the stomach with this bayonet. And it was like this agreement. Uh, this is so trippy. I don't even know how to talk about it well in words. <laughs> but it was this idea of like um, really taking this energy of patriarchy and whatever like this imbalance that has come into play since the fall of Atlantis in particular that attacker energy which I think like I think the recent manifestation is patriarchy slash this like any kind of false hierarchy like I think feminine masculine energies have existed on this planet probably for a long time in different forms or something but like it can play out in terms of like like presenting as though s s any any type of quality in a person is better than another for like no fucking reason. So ableism or racism or um, transphobia, like I, I think in this past life context, but I'm speaking obviously as a white cishet woman. So like through that lens of only knowing that experience now, 
Um, but my sense is that in this larger past life context, it's those energies that have kind of created these bullshit hierarchies that we have today and like the discrimination that's connected to them. So in this, in the past life regression sessions where we specifically looked at that life and this death injury, um, it was like the sense that I had and like Taya, the practitioner I work with, um, had had was that I needed to like bring it into my body, like my energetic body and my physical body more so, so that I would then have to transmute it and like really integrate it and heal it to like super deeply understand what the fuck it actually is. So that was like the agreement in that lifetime. And I still, I can feel it right now. I'm still very aware of that part of my body and sensations there that seem to suggest that there's something there that's still not cleared. So during this course, it was interesting because I got like period cramps that like seemed to come from that spot, seemed to like really be focused in that area. And then I think those cleared up within a couple days. And I remember like on the third or so day of that course, I remember like being in my room and feeling like, like, oh, this is what it's like when you're going crazy. Like, this is what it is to go insane. And just, it just felt so overwhelming. I can't even fully go back into what that experience was now. I had some a kind of similar experience like last week, but it was like a less intense sort of like different facet of it. Um, and that cleared in like two or three days or something like that. Um, and I also started to become aware think it was in this course it was definitely at this center um maybe it was in a the next time I was I was at the center but I'll just share it now I started to realize that I could do anapana meditation for like 20 minutes without my mind wandering um when you start out of the vipassana courses you start with anapana meditation which is awareness of the breath to sharpen your mind and then once your mind is sharp enough and you have enough of a sort of foundation of morality shila so in the courses they introduce us on like the after like three and a half days of anapana um then you start doing vipassana so you start with anapana um and i started to become aware that sorry i, I meant to say that uh in the courses when you're first starting out they try to get you to work up to being able to to, to do a minute of anapana without your mind wandering um and i became aware around this time that i was able to do like 20 20 some minutes of anapana without my mind wandering like i'd develop my concentration further and my ability to focus and stuff um yeah what else oh toward the end of that course i i remember i rang the bell at that course to for everybody to get up in the morning and i appreciated being able to do that like active service for everybody and it felt nice um, and I remember walking around at one point and thinking like, oh, everybody else's agitation is bothering me less than it used to. Um, something I've been trying to move through for, for years now is this thing of like feeling other people's pain, feeling their sankara and having my own sankara, my own resistance to being able to feel their stuff. Sometimes that'll come up like I'll think like like I, I'll wish somebody would have healed their thing so that I wouldn't have to suffer in feeling it, too. Um, but I know that when I get to a certain stage, um, I'll just have compassion for them. It'll no longer um, interact with something unhealed in me and make me in any way feel um, worn down by it. But I'm not there yet. And um, I think this thing in my shoulders, again, this like a tacky thing in the back of my shoulders is very connected to this specific Sankara. But I remember at that particular course that it seemed like it was getting better. And then at the end, it was interesting to me at least that I like, um, I needed a towel. I needed to borrow a towel. I brought everything from my parents' place in Ohio in like a single duffel bag. And I brought a towel, but then I realized like since I'm flying back, it'd be better to let that towel dry, you know, like to not put a wet towel in my bag. And it's no big deal if you just borrow stuff at the course. So I could just ask to borrow a towel there um, and then leave it. And I had so much trouble asking for the simple thing that I intellectually understood was no big deal at all. And I really had to like screw up all my courage to ask. And then I finally asked. And of course, it, it was like nothing. <laughs> and like it, the reason it was interesting to me was because it really made me deeply recognize in a way that I hadn't before, like how much I struggled to ask for the most basic like things that humans need, <laughs> you know, and and that was a huge part of why I had so much financial trouble. Um, it, I, it was a chunk of it. Like, 
but it was like I let myself get backed into a corner and until it was more painful not to ask than to ask. And coming from that place, of course, I wasn't like finding, I wasn't aligning with people who were like the right people to align with to really sustain seeds and help it to grow. So it like really showed up strongly at the end of that course. And then after I met this really cool girl there, Katie, I hope I run into her again because she lives in LA. Um, I was wearing like a tech stars hoodie while I was there and she came up and talked to me about tech stuff and her involvement in tech and crypto. And um, she was really funny and awesome. And I was Facebook friends with her, but then I got off Facebook pretty soon after that. Um, so yeah, hopefully I'll run into her sometime. I owe her lunch. She bought me lunch afterward, and um, which was really sweet of her. But uh, yeah, and like then I got a ride back and I remember I was trying to not get a ride back <laughs> with like another know-it-all-y guy. But of course, since I was resisting that, that's what I ended up with. Um, and, uh, yeah. And I remember coming back to LA and I was planning to ask some friends just to crash at their place. And, um, I think I, I think I reached out, I texted them, but they hadn't responded and I got back and I had no money to stay anywhere else. Um, and didn't have anyone else I could ask at short notice. And I remember like walking the beach near their place cause they live in Playa del Rey and just thinking about sleeping on the beach and stuff. And then finally just going to their house and knocking um, and just being like so terrified of knocking or just like it was the same Sankara like this asking for help about a pretty basic thing I mean you know it's not cool to like just show up on someone's door like unannounced in that way but since I had texted them and I knew they didn't I'd stayed there a bunch of times before and they really didn't care um, yeah but there, there was a little bit of something I was picking up on that showed itself later that made it harder to ask because it wasn't fully supported in the way that it is with like, um, just like a healthier friendship. But yeah, it was just so fucking hard to do that. So I was like thinking about sleeping outside, but then ultimately didn't have to. So, huh. It's like interesting to like go back into that energy. Cause I was so, yeah, I just spent a really long time trying to get support, um, it goes back to like my family of origin and stuff like there wasn't support there so getting basic needs met felt like a struggle and it felt like a hard thing to do um and then I was really conditioned to like find other people like my family who didn't want to support um or who were hostile slash were hostile um when I ask uh yeah so it's just interesting to kind of look back at that energy now because I've I've really come a long way since then and I wasn't I mean it's over four years ago now, but so much has changed in like the last few years. It's trippy. Uh, the seventh session, the seventh course that I sat, um, I'm already three minutes, 33 minutes into this recording too. So I did this over my birthday in 2018. My birthday is April 2nd. So this is my 34th birthday. Um, for a while I did up until COVID, I did a course over every birthday um, for a bunch in a row. I missed one, I think. And so that was the thing that I did. It's like the awesomest birthday present you can give yourself. So over my 34th birthday, I decided to serve my first ever course. So this was my seventh course. So I'd sat six courses before serving one, and that's atypical. Excuse me. I'd done other types of service. Like I served three days in between a course once, and I'd hosted at the Dama house in New York um and which is like just meant that I opened the door and was in there to run the recordings for people that wanted to come and meditate at this they had this like I'm sure it's still there they had this apartment in Times Square that they rented specifically for Vipassana old students and you could go there and sit and so I was like the host there for a while a host there were several um but yeah I hadn't properly served a 10-day course and the reason was because of I, everything is so connected, isn't it? it? I mean, the reason I had resisted doing it was in part because I felt like I couldn't leave work for that long. Um, and that's another reason that Seeds is all about, like, trying to get us out of this trap of fucking this idea of jobs having to be a certain way where you can't take off a week and a half for, like, what I think I'm I feel so sure is, like, the most important thing that humans can possibly do. Um, but uh, that was part of it. And then the other part of it was just, like, I was so... I just was afraid slash didn't feel like I could handle being in other people's energy in that environment as I worked. Um, I was just really afraid of 
being around their Sankara or something in that environment. Like, and it's the same thing of this like fear of attack thing and like being able to feel other people's pain and whatever. I just didn't feel like I could handle it. But at that point, I figured like, okay, I've done six courses. Like I, I want to try to do this. It's time for me to do this. I want to like give back in a specific way. So, so I chose to serve this course. Um, I got a ride up from San Francisco to the center in Kelseyville in Northern California. So it's like, as is typical, it was like three hours or so outside of the city, something like that. And I ended up getting a ride with this guy just coincidentally who, um, he was like involved with Boost VC, the Bitcoin focused startup accelerator I mentioned that Seeds went through. He had gone through it too, <laughs> at like a different time. So like, I don't know, it wasn't like, it was just like a weird coincidence. Um, and so he co-founded a startup and, uh, I remember he corrected me on the ride because he said, I called it, uh, I was referring to the cryptocurrency as Ethereum, and he was like, no, the crypto's Ether. And I remember I thought he was wrong, but he wasn't wrong. Um, so he was involved with crypto at that time, too. Uh, this was early 2018, like I said. So, yeah, I got a ride with him. He was kind of like startup bro -y a little bit, and like this energy of, just, you know, whatever that is. And I felt myself being too deferential to it, like I did for a long time. Um, I was just, like, deferential to a variety of unhealthy forms of masculine energy, like, and still am to some degree now, um, but just, like, for a super long time. And I was kind of doing that with him. Um, yeah, and we got there late, I remember, too. So, yeah, I, I was given the job of manager at this course. So if you ever sit a course, you'll you'll see that there are like the servers who are working in the kitchen and then there's like a male manager and a female manager. Um, they still classify gender in that way there. It's like male and female. And uh, yeah, so if you're on the female side and you need any material thing, um, you ask the female manager for that. Um, and then if you have questions about the meditation and stuff, you talk to the teacher. So it was interesting. That was the other thing I was freaking out about a little or just like, in some ways, like, I mean, I've been told that female manager is the hardest job that you can do as a server. And I think that's, I think that's true. Um, especially like the first three to four days or so, because especially when people, when it's their first course, um, and they maybe don't like that it hasn't clicked for them yet, excuse me. And you're the only out, like you're the only person they can talk to besides the teacher. Like I got so many requests for just like shit that like was not necessary. Or it was just like, I could see that it was somebody who was just like freaking out or like was having Sankara come up. And so they like made it into a thing where they thought they needed something or, you know, they talked to me three or four times in a day or whatever. Um, and, uh, and I could just see that it was about their stuff, but if they were earlier in their practice, you know, like they didn't have the awareness yet that it was, they were feeling compelled to do this because it was about stuff that was coming up in them. So it was that thing of kind of like feeling their stuff and also being quote unquote, like negatively impacted by it because it was like, um, being put upon me in a certain way. So the first few days at a regular 10 day when you're the manager are often super hectic if you're the female manager like guys males people on that side of the, the hall um tend to ask for a lot less stuff as I understand um yeah so there was that and I remember um I, I spotted them at the beginning of the course too a couple people that I could tell would be more agitated um and then that ended up playing out just like that what I saw was there um but there was this woman Mina who I could see was more more agitated, and she asked me for a bunch of stuff throughout the course. But then at the end, she came up to me, and she was, like, so sincerely grateful for, like, because I'd served. And she was talking to me, and she told me about how her husband had died not so long ago, and she used to – she would meditate for, like, three hours a day with this other form of meditation that was just about focus. And she said that she knew that something was missing, and – since she'd been at the Vipassana course, she was like, oh, this is the thing that was missing, the thing that, like, takes you deeper than just the focus. Um, and it was really, like, just, like, lovely. And I, I just felt um, grateful and just, like, wonderful that I got to be, even though she had more agitation coming up and, like, it was more challenging for me at the beginning. Like, she got to this place at the end where she just, like, she got it. She understood it. And I got to be 
a part of her, you know, like moving through that and reaching that point in attended course. That was really great. It was really amazing. Um, yeah. And I, the most difficult part of that course that I recall, um, had to do with there was this other meditator named Susan who she had like a more aggressive energy and she left on day three so you can if you go to a course I mean they ask you to commit to staying for the 10 days because it's like it's so fucking true I mean they they say he the teacher going talks at the end about how they they used to experiment with doing shorter courses. They tried a seven day. They realized seven days was too short and 10 days was the shortest they could do. It's so fucking true, man. Like I, I've met, I met a guy in France um, who, it's weird. I'm having deja vu about a lot of this. I feel like I've talked about some of this before, but I don't think I've talked, I mean, I don't think I've talked about these specific courses, so I'm confused unless I'm, I jumped dimensions or something and recorded this in another timeline. Anyway, this guy, I met in France. He was telling me about how he sat a seven day. I might've talked about this specific anecdote before, but he'd sat like a seven day course through like, uh, fuck. Like the, I think it was like uh, spirit rock, maybe like the Jack Cornfield center. And, or maybe it was something in Massachusetts cause he was based in New York. But in any case, it was like a seven day thing. And he left and he was like in the midst of a huge fucking like, like enormous Sankara was coming up and he couldn't handle it. And he ended up like, feeling like he had to talk to his therapist a bunch and he spent thousands of dollars. Lucky for him, he had thousands of dollars to like talk to a therapist to get him out of like the depths of this enormous emotional turmoil that was coming up like on day seven. In a 10 day course, you're able to move through stuff like that and you have support around you and it's just, it's a better thing. So like I'm, I'm very convinced that 10 days is the shortest amount of time that you can go and actually get true value out of a course. Um, there are older teachers. I'm reading a book right now by this guy, Letty Sayada, who lived around the turn of the 20th century. He's, he was a Vipassana teacher, but his belief was that, uh, you, you needed to sit a 30 day course in order to get real insight about the nature of reality. And I haven't sat a 30 day yet. I'm, I'm really trying to sit one and I keep getting rejected, but, um, hopefully I'll get to do that before too long. And then I can, you know, from my own experience, talk about whether whether or not that seems to be true, if there are more insights that I'm able to glean that are, like, specific to that length of time. Um, yeah, but Susan, so, like, you can leave is what I'm trying to get at. Like, they ask you to stay. If you can stay, you really should. I mean, if you leave on day three or day four or something, you're just, like, you're going to miss out on something that's, like, the most wonderful thing I've ever found. And and Goinka was trying to leave on day two. <laughs> like he he talks about how like he was trying to sneak out his first course um, on day two. He was just going to have, he was like so rich that a car would bring him like laundry and stuff every night. And he was just going to like sneak out and leave with the car when it came. But they could talk at that course and another meditator heard that he was planning to leave. And she came and talked him out of it. She was like, just try to stay for one more day. And he did. And then made progress and ended up doing everything he did. And like every time he tells that story, I mean, it's a recording, but every time I've seen the recording of him telling that story, I just feel so much gratitude for that other meditator who he said was, a, it was like a woman who's a professor at uh, a university in Burma. I just love her so much um, because she did that. And then that makes me feel inspired too, to, to, to be brave enough to try and speak up in instances like that to somebody because like holy fuck like who knows what the ripple slash whatever like the butterfly effect could be longer term like he scaled this up so it's all around the world now and easily accessible pretty much anywhere because that woman like talked to him had that single conversation like how trippy is that it's like amazing but susan left on day three and i didn't know what to say to her to because you don't want to like like you're not it's not fucking like you're trying to convert somebody to like Jesus or something it's not like it's just not like that I didn't know like what to say and she was so she left because she got she was having see that's the fucking that's the sad thing the heartbreaking part of it she wasn't far enough into the course to like have gotten the idea that stuff the physical discomfort that was coming on the surface had to do with the sankara that we're clearing out of her 
she was having headaches and she was standing up in the back of the room during a discourse one night and the teacher asked me as the manager to go up to Susan and ask her to sit down on the floor and she had this like really strong reaction to like authority when that happened she had some sankara about authority I guess and she was like why the why is she like why is she telling me that and like just this really strong reaction and then like the next day she came and like like pounded on the door where I was standing. I had like my own tiny little like hut without a bathroom and stuff. Um, I had to go like use the the bathroom in the, uh, the like the server's quarters. I think they've since built bigger server's quarters there though. Um, and I remember just like, I just stayed in the room and I didn't answer the door. Like I just couldn't, I just didn't have the energy to face her yet. <laughs> And she like went to the kitchen or something and then they like came and got me. So I had to go deal with it. And they, the other servers could see like how tired I was. Like I remember this other server who was really fun. I hope I run into her again sometime. This girl, Sarah, um, she was so great. She was so nice. Um, she was like, she said she heard somebody was leaving and she thought it was me because <laughs> she could see how just like, like weighed down I was those first several days. Um, so yeah, I, I just helped Susan leave. I just helped her pack up her stuff and like open the, the gate for her. And, and that was that. And she left and she probably won't, you know, like ever go back. I don't know in this lifetime at least. Um, and I don't know what I could have said that could have made things different. Um, but that like was, that was really difficult for me. I like, I felt this real, uh, like devastation that she, she went and when you're just meditating you know when you're sitting of course a lot of times you're not even aware that people leave it's I think it's something like five percent on average will leave a course um during the course and you know so that's that's the average over courses so it varies course to course but yeah I, she took off and yeah it was just I was I felt very burdened by it and I remember noticing later on that that had shifted like when I served later courses I was less um heartbroken when that happened uh, but yeah I was that was hard during that course um yeah that's this is already hella long like longer than I expected and I've only talked about two sessions two courses so I will just make more episodes of this I guess than I originally thought I would need to but yeah thanks for listening I'll start with my eighth course the next time I continue this and sooner or later I'll, uh, sooner or later I'll get through all 18 courses